In the previous modules, we developed the theory behind the analysis of variance and the use of linear models. Now let's look at how we would actually analyze data generated from a study that would use an analysis of variance. To do so, we'll use the hypothetical data we were looking at for cost of flights, and we'll actually investigate whether, on the basis of this sample, we have evidence that, in the population, there really is some determination based on the type of airline a person is flying. Remember, these are hypothetical data, but in any situation where we have more than two groups, we'll need to use an analysis of variance. We'll see that in JUMP, there are two different ways we can perform a one-way or one-factor analysis of variance. We can use fit y by x or fit model. We'll look at both of these methods, but we'll start with fit y by x since this is what we have used before. If you have the journal that accompanies this module, you'll find the data for a hypothetical cost of flights under the fitting ANOVA models and jump section under data. I'll open that data set now, and let's remind ourselves what data we have. For 100 randomly selected individuals, we imagined we asked these individuals what airline they were flying and what their cost of flight was. We also have data on their flight duration, which we'll come back to at a later time. Let's first investigate the distribution of cost of flight, ignoring airline, just to see what types of data we have. I'll go to Analyze, select Distribution, and put in Cost of Flight as my Y. Next, I'll hit OK, and we'll get the histogram for cost of flight, our quantiles, and our basic summary statistics. We'll see that overall, individuals are spending on average about $300, with a standard deviation of 26.26. Notice that with our analysis of variance, this is the variability we're seeking to explain. We want to know why people differ from that average amount, and we hope that airline will be an explanatory factor, that airline will actually absorb or explain some of that variability, that is, the differences between each individual and the grand mean. Let's actually use fit y by x and run the analysis of variance model. I'll go to Analyze, select fit y by x, and I'll put airline as my factor. That's the thing we want to make predictions from. Next, I'll put cost of flight as my Y, and you'll see immediately that Jump designates this as a one-way analysis. When I click OK, Jump will return the basic fit Y by X output. In order to get the ANOVA, or the analysis of variance output, we'll go to the red triangle, and I'll select means ANOVA. Let's take a moment to look through the different components of this output, specifically the analysis of variance table. Let's start with a corrected total. These are the sums of squares associated with the Y column. That is, these are the sums of squares we would find if we were ignoring the model altogether and simply finding the variability in cost of flight. You might remember when we looked at the distribution output, there was variability in how much people paid. People paid different amounts than average. These sums of squares are how you would find the variance of Y. These are simply the total amount of variability we have to explain. Now, our analysis of variance model is seeking to explain that total variability on the basis of some treatment. So we also have the sums of squares associated with that treatment. Treatment here is simply what airline people are flying on. So these are the sums of squares associated with that explanatory factor. This is literally how much variability those treatments or those groups can explain in that total. Now we also have the sums of squares error. This is the remaining variability. This, if you recall, is the sums of squares within, the degree to which individuals are varying around their own group means. From these sums of squares, we also get mean squares, or variances, associated with each source. We have a mean square for treatment, that is, the variance that is explained by the treatment categories. We also have the mean square for error. This is the prevailing variability after we've explained everything we can explain with the different airlines. With the mean square treatment and the mean square error, we can derive our F ratio. Remember, the F ratio is simply the ratio of mean squares for treatment divided by the mean square for error. If the null hypothesis is true, we would expect an F observed around 1, because those two mean squares would, in essence, be estimating random variability. In this case, we have an F ratio that is considerably larger than 1. In other words, this is an F ratio that would be unlikely to occur if those two mean squares were simply estimating the same thing. In this case, the numerator mean square, the mean square for treatment, is considerably larger. That's why we have an F ratio greater than 1. Finally, from this F ratio, we can derive our p-value. 
That is, the probability, if the null is true, that we would observe an f observed this extreme, that is, this far from one in the positive direction, or one more extreme. In essence, this p-value tells us the probability of randomly sampling groups that would give us these deviations that would result in those treatment differences that are this large. Now, the way we got this p-value is by knowing the degrees of freedom and applying that fischer snedeker distribution. Notice we have the degrees of freedom for airline, which we found before to be 2, and the degrees of freedom for air, which we also found before to be 97. If I go forward and show you the f distribution with 2 and 97 degrees of freedom, we can see that our f observed of 6.37 is very far out in the tail. It lands us firmly in the critical region. That is, the region of the sampling distribution we specified before doing our study that would lead us to reject the null hypothesis.